Today we're covering how to use 3GS post processing. Uh, good. By the end of this tutorial, you will understand what post processing is, not just like a bunch of code, but fundamentally how it works in big games, the 3GS APIs for post processing, and how to actually code this up. So let's dive in right away on what exactly post processing is. Now you can skip this part, jump right to the code, but you may pick up some things you didn't know. Okay, so what's post processing? You can probably guess from the name, it's some sort of processing that happens after, i.e. the post part. There's some parallels with other forms of media. For example, in movies, these days you always have some form of post production. Easy example. Here's a behind the scenes on the Avengers. And here you've got all the actors, green screens, then you have various bits of background and CGI that are composited in, then maybe some passes for the overall look and tone of the movie, playing with color and all that crap. Another example. You can see from these shots, here's some of the behind the scenes work on Mad Max Fury Road, and a lot of effort went into transforming the scenes from what was filmed into the final shot. Here's a few quick examples, never mind the introduction of additional scenery, but there's been a bunch of work including color grading to get that final stylistic effect the movie has. But it's not just limited to slight color changes and that kind of thing. Here they actually took day shots and those can be transformed into super stylized night shots through post work. And you can do similar types of things on your home computer. Bring up Photoshop, or the poor man's Photoshop, GIMP, which is what I use, and let's just load up an image. I'll just pick something to get us started. And I'll reproduce some common easy post effects right here in GIMP. So for example, you might want to play with the saturation of the scene. So I can just go here into the menu, here's the saturation menu, and by sliding this back and forth, see I can completely desaturate the entire thing, giving me a black and white scene, or I can pump it up, giving me, I don't know, let's call it stylized. Let's pull up one of the Mad Max Fury Road scenes. So here's that desert shot. No idea what was going on there, but uh, maybe I can go rewatch it. Anyway, I'll just go screw with some of the parameters. So let's go fiddle with the color temperature and just drop it the way the hell down. Not bad, but now let's go into the color balance and here I can play with the overall color in the scene and I'll just crank the blue a bit. Finally, let's head over to the levels menu and this kind of lets me set the color range of the image and I'll just slide this up a bit here. The final shot kind of looks nighttimey. Not bad, I mean, I don't do this for a living so this is the best you're getting from me. But you're not just totally limited to just messing around with color. Your effect can be multi-stage. Like here's a random city shot I found off Google Images and if we take this and I'll duplicate the layer. Next, I'll go into the levels editor and we'll screw around a bit just to mostly leave the lights and bright objects in the scene. That way we're left with everything bright and shiny. Next, we can go into the contrast and boost that. And this can have the effect of making what we're going to bloom out really colorful. Or you could go the other way too, desaturate it or skip this step altogether, up to you. Once we're done there, we can go to here to the blur filter and we'll apply a Gaussian blur over the layer. So what we're left with is this kind of blurry, unfocused image. Now when we take that layer, we can additively blend it over the original image and voila, you've got a basic bloom effect. The point is, post-processing is pretty much like taking your image and photoshopping it. So how do games do post-processing? It's not that dissimilar. Typically, you'll see a setup like this, where you're done rendering your scene, and you've got something like this. Here's your color buffer, here's your depth buffer, and now you're going to take these inputs and whatever others you decide to pass in, and you'll likely apply it to a texture as a quad and render it out with a custom vertex or fragment shader, or both. So for example, you start with this game scene, and maybe you have this custom fragment shader that contrasts the scene. So you take your input image, apply this chunk of shader code that does the simple contrast, and out comes the contrasted image. Maybe in the next stage, you take that as an input, and now you want to grayscale things. So you apply another custom shader here that converts to grayscale, and out comes the grayscaled image. So overall, we've got this whole post-processing pipeline here, where you start with the game's rendered image, and then you've got this series of steps where some sort of image manipulation occurs. And it's important to note, although in our specific examples, each step was just a simple operation, they don't have to be. Each step may do a whole bunch of crap, just like we did with the bloomed image. Now let's take a look at 3JS's post-processing docs. First up, you've got this Effect Composer. And as it says right here in the docs, this class manages a chain of post-processing passes to produce the final visual result. 
you can think of the Effect Composer as the pipeline from before. It's responsible for managing each of these steps and producing the final image. And the way that you would use the Effect Composer is by instantiating what are called passes and adding those to the Effect Composer instance using this add pass function. And passes are essentially the steps in the post-processing pipeline. They're the ones that do all the heavy lifting of actual image manipulation. So let's dive into the code. Like always, I'm going to skip some basic steps and just work with what's already been made. So I'll start by creating a new directory. Let's call it 3JS Tutorial Post Processing. And I'm going to copy everything from the basic 3D World tutorial into there. Most of this is just setup code to get us going. There's nothing to be gained by rewriting this boilerplate after you've already done it once. In the code here, we need to import the required files first. At the top of the file here, I've just added these two lines to import both the effect composer and the render pass, which is enough to get us started. Now down here in the init code, we need to do some basic changes to start using post-processing. First thing we need to do is actually instantiate an effect composer. And that's just a quick one line of code where we new an instance of effect composer and pass it the WebGL renderer instance as a parameter. Now we need to add the first pass to it, and this is why we imported render pass. Render pass's job is to actually render the seam, same way we normally do when we call 3js.render and pass the scene in camera. We actually have to pass the scene in camera as parameters so that it can do just that, render the scene for us and save it to a texture. The next change we need to make is down in the render call. Instead of calling 3js render, we're switching that to composer.render. Load this up and you see, well, a basic scene. But it's running through the Effect Composer now, instead of just being composited directly onto the scene. So that's something. It's not much, but it, it's something. Back in the code, we'll actually have to do something. So first thing we'll do is go to the top and import Unreal Bloom Pass, which is one of the built-in passes that 3GS already offers. And this pass does something pretty similar to what we did in our Photoshop example earlier. Down in the main code, after the effect composer has been instantiated, we just need to instantiate an instance of the Unreal Bloom Pass, and we'll set some of the parameters. You don't need to worry too much about them, they're mostly self-explanatory, but since there doesn't seem to be any documentation on it, I get to make up a bunch of crap. Resolution refers to the internal size of the render target it uses to create the bloom buffer, strength refers to the strength of the bloom effect, radius refers to the size of the bloom. Threshold controls how bright things need to be before they bloom. So now that we've got a bloom pass in, let's load this up, and voila, bunch of bloom on the screen. Kind of neat, it gives a very dreamy vibe to things, and you could imagine having a city scene at night, neon lights, and this could be really cool. There's a whole lot more built-in passes. In fact, there's a whole directory full of them here. You can scroll through and check them out. And of course, you can always go to the 3GS examples and see what many of them look like. I'm going to add glitch pass now, just to show you that it can be done. So here, I'll have to import it again at the top, pretty much the same thing as we did with Unreal Bloom Pass, with the name glitch pass subbed in. Then down in the effect composer, it's a simple matter of instantiating an instance of a glitch pass. So we'll write the line out, new glitch pass, and luckily this one doesn't take any parameters, so all we have to do is create it and add it. And once that's done, you can load it, and if you wait a second, you'll see it go off. All right, cool. So we have a couple passes. I'm going to mention another one that's super accessible for beginners. You can define your own basic passes using shader pass, as long as you supply a vertex and fragment shader definition. There's a whole bunch of pre-built ones already on GitHub. You can scroll through and see the full list. I'll just add the luminosity shader here just to show how it's done. So up at the top, you import the shader this time, and it's in a slightly different directory, but pretty much the same thing as importing the passes. You also need to import this new shader pass class, and we'll use that for creating a pass out of a shader. Now down in the effect composer, it's just a tiny bit of extra work. You have to instantiate an instance of a shader pass, and we pass in the shader, and then of course add it to the effect composer. Loading that up should show off the new pass. So now you've got bloom, glitch, and your luminosity passes running. The luminosity pass being just a grayscale thing where we visualize the brightness of the scene. Of course, you can also just define your own shader. So here I've quickly crapped out a quick one that does contrast. So the shader definition is pretty simple. I've got my uniforms. In this case, I only need the previous render target. 
Vertex shader does nothing except transform the position and pass the UV coordinates down. In the fragment shader, we do a quick texture lookup and then a contrast operation. This line here, all it does is you set a midpoint value, in my case I use 0.5, then you subtract that, multiply by a contrast value, and add that 0.5 back in. The end result will be like pushing the colors away from the midpoint. Down here in the effect composer, I'm just going to remove the luminosity pass, and I'll swap it for my new shader. So that means I had to change the parameter. That's all. Now when I load it up, it's all super contrasty. And I could of course go into the shader and do a lot more, but we're going to end things here since this is just a beginner tutorial. There's a lot more material to cover with post effects, like rolling your own pass, but that's more involved. Maybe it needs to downres the image and filter it, or do some blurring, all of which is possible but way beyond a beginner level. Hope this was interesting, make sure to like and subscribe, codes on GitHub, see you next time. Cheers.